Ladies and gentlemen, Cotiso is very proud and pleased to introduce one of our lead speakers. He's Professor Mark Hegelson, who has been a lead teacher development in development workshops throughout Asia and has been a featured speaker at Kamiko Tessel, Jolt, and Thai Tessel. He is the author of over 100 books and articles, including the English First Hand and Workplace English series by Mongmen and Active Listening by Cambridge. Professor Hegelson is, is in the Department of Intercultural Studies, Miyagi Gakuin Women's University, Sendai, Japan. He also teaches in the MA TESOL program at Columbia University Teachers College in Japan. I, Professor Hegelson has given very kind permission. If you have questions during his talk, to raise your hand. Also, there'll be perhaps some time after the talk to ask questions, and Professor Hegelson will also be giving a live webcam outside in... Actually, I think in here. In here. Right afterwards. Right, right afterwards, so you can remain afterwards to be part of a different question and answer session. Without further ado, let us give a big welcome to Professor Hegelson. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm excited to be here. It's, it's always fun to come to Korea TESOL, the people and the energy and the food. Um, so it's always good to be in Korea. And I'm very excited about our topic, which is language planning. Because I think language planning is an exciting and a very powerful tool. And it's a powerful tool you can use tomorrow morning. It's a tool you can add to nearly any classroom. It's a tool you can add to nearly any textbook. Uh, and so that's what we want to look at. Now, it always helps me as a presenter to have some idea who I'm talking to. Can I ask, where do you teach? How many of you are teaching college or university? Okay, quite a few. High school? Some junior high? Okay, kids? Okay, language institute people? Right, you're the ones who raise your hand on all of them, right? Because <laughs> that runs the gamut. Okay, great. So we're coming from many, many different places, um, and many different experiences, and, and so that will be interesting to see how we can add that to the, um, to the workshop. Language planning. Um, over the past couple of decades, as language teaching has become more communicative, we have accepted certain truths, right? And so we, we know that uh, the way students learn English is by using English, and that's true. And the more English they use, the more they're going to learn, and that's true. But we sometimes take it to sort of the illogical extreme, therefore they ought to be speaking English every minute in the classroom. And so that leads us to a situation where we, we go in and we say, for example, uh, pair work and your A and your B talk, <laughs> right? And we, we demand instant production. And what happens when we demand instant production? Silence. Silence, exactly. Silence or um, what do you like, sports? You know, they, they come up with whatever they can come up with immediately. But the, the problem, I, I'd like to try a little experiment, um, and it'll be interesting because I've never done it with, with a group this size. What I'd like to do is ask the, um, the Koreans here to do this in English, and the foreigners see this coming, right? <laughs> and I'd like the, the foreigners to, to do this in Korean, okay? And some of you are like, I can't, I can't. What do we do every day of the week, right? We walk into the classroom and say, come on, guys, you can do it, right? So I'd like to try, this is a fluency activity. The Koreans are doing it in English. The foreigners, if you've been here more than six months, you have some level of Korean. And... Um, just to make it interesting, how many of you know the story of Romeo and Juliet? All of us, well, you know, we've read the story or you've seen the movie or something. What I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you, groups of two, groups of three, and uh, with your partner, you have a minute or two, tell the story of Romeo and Juliet. Now, to make it easier, we all know music is good. For so I'm going to put on some nice, uh, relaxing background background music. And can I can I actually turn to your partner, Romeo and Juliet? Go.
Gu- guys, can, can, now can, can we pull it together? I wish it, it was it was fascinating. It was fascinating listening to the sound. I don't speak Korean, so I have no idea what y'all were actually saying. But what was interesting is that it started out a little bit of silence, and then it went. <laughs> yeah? I mean, there was a lot of, of talking right at the beginning. And my guess is it was something the equivalent of, okay, so there were these two families that were fighting, but the, the girl and the boy met at a party and they fell in love and... and... <laughs> and some stuff happened and then they died. <laughs> right? It's something like that. And that's the problem with instant production. With demanding instant production, they can say something, but they can only say what they can come up with immediately. They end up with, and some stuff happened. And they end up not having the depth that they want and the depth that they're capable of. It's a little bit like, there's a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon that I like a lot where uh, Calvin's on the playground and Mo, the school bully, comes up behind him, knocks Calvin on says, Wimp! And Calvin says, Oh, oh yeah? And then, silence, and he says, You know, what really bugs me is knowing that I'll probably come up with a much sharper retort sometime tonight. <laughs> and Calvin is speaking his mother tongue. Yeah? And what we're asking our students to do in the classroom so often is come up with something in a foreign language immediately. So it's like we're asking them to create content, think of what they want to say, and create the form, figure out how they're going to say it, at the same time in the foreign language. And in the process of that, we lock them in to a very surface level of language that we don't have to. What's the solution? Well, for me, the solution is language planning. And what do I mean by language planning? Well, let me clarify something first because there are two very different things that are called language planning. One is what I, what I think is pra- perhaps more properly called language policy. And that's like the Ministry of Education deciding that uh, English will be taught in the elementary school. Some people call that language planning. That's not what I'm talking about. That's language policy. What I'm talking about... To put it simply is giving the students time to think. And time to think, what do I want to say? And how am I going to say it? And this, the, these two items will come back several times during this presentation. Because this is, there are many, many ways to do it. But that's basic. It, it is this simple. It is this common sense thing. Language planning as something we can look at and research and use in our classroom is relatively new, but this is something you've all done naturally. Think of when you first started using another language. And let's say uh, you needed to go shopping. So for the foreigners, perhaps it's when you came to Korea. For the Koreans, the first time you, you let's say you went abroad, or you, you're going shopping, and you're in a store, and you know that you're going to have to say something like, where's the... Right? And you know that you're going to hear maybe some numbers for floor numbers, or you're going to hear some directions. And then you're going to say something like, how much is this, or how much is it? And you're going to hear, and you do a little mental rehearsal, right? That's language planning. And good language learners have always done that. But I think we'll find it's, it's relatively easy to just add a step so it's not just for the good language learners. Why is language planning so important? In the middle of this session, I'm going to go into some of the specifics, but what I'd like to do is give you a list of the benefits and then do a couple of activities that reflect on it. And so as we do the activities, you can be noticing these um, items. Why language planning? Why? Okay, basically we just said language planning is giving students time before an activity to think What am I going to say? How am I going to say it? And it results in increased fluency. Which makes sense. You've been through it once. You've been through it mentally. But you've been through it. So naturally, it's a little little smoother. Right? Increased complexity. Which again, you've been through it once in your mind. So you're able to put it together a little more precisely. You're able to say a little more exactly what you want to say. Increased accuracy 
sometimes. This is, <laughs> accuracy is complex, okay, and, this is, and we'll talk about that. Sometimes one of the benefits of language planning is increased accuracy. Sometimes it's not, but when it's not, it's for a good reason that we'll go into in the mi middle. Uh, greater vocabulary variety. When students have time to think it through, they're able to access some of the vocabulary they're in the process of learning. And there is some evidence that language planning can help avoid fossilization. Okay? So those are the benefits. As I said, we'll go, we'll go into more depth, but as we do a couple of activities, I'd like to ask you to just notice with yourself. Notice fluency. Notice complexity. Notice accuracy. Notice those issues. What I'd like you to do is look at the handout... Look at the handout that says, do it a, your history. Yeah. Looks like this at the, uh, the top. And this is a pair work. And it's a typical pair work in that there's a whole bunch of questions. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to your partner. And again, for, for the sake of making this real, can I ask the, uh, the Koreans to do this in English, the foreigners to, to try it in Korean? And it doesn't matter if you have a, a pair that one person's a foreigner and one person's a Korean, because like, if you're speaking Korean, her Korean's really good, I heard, you know. So, okay? So it doesn't, it, you don't have to have uh, a partner who's speaking the same language. Can I ask you, before we do this, um, just to take a moment and look over this sheet and uh, just read the questions to yourself. And I'll put on a little music. And did you notice that as you were doing that, you were not simply reading questions, you were automatically constructing answers? Because in order to understand the question, you had to be processing what was behind it. So if you looked at that one that said, uh, a scar, you know, tell, you know, talk about a scar, you were thinking, oh yeah, and how did I get that? Just by taking a minute to look over the questions, you start thinking of, of the answers, okay? But of course, we can do it more, more specifically. What I'd like to do, I'd like to ask this half of the room. Can you, um, there are what, eight? One, two, three, four. There are eight questions there. And if this is a pair work, then the, the other partner would have eight questions. That's 16 questions. If they spend a couple of minutes on each one, that's a half hour. You probably don't have a half hour uh, in your class. So the students aren't actually going to get to all of them. Could I ask you to take a minute and decide one or two questions that would be interesting for you to answer and what you're going to say about them? That's this half of the room. This half of the room, I'm going to give you a slightly different task. You know a Likert scale, right? When you're doing research and it's always like one means most, five means least, rate it. I, I've always thought the Likert scale should be uh, replaced by smileys because it's a more internationally uh, you know, understandable uh, scale. What I'd like this half of the room to do is look at every question. If it's an interesting question, it gets a smile. If it's a boring question, it gets a frown. And if it's a just, yeah, I could answer that if I had to, then it gets sort of a neutral face. So this half of the group, you're deciding which to answer and think about your answer. This half of the group, you're just evaluating the questions. You've got about a minute. The items. The items that you're going to talk about with your partner.
And now, I'd like, I'd just think about what you just did compared to what we often do in the classroom. Standard classroom behavior is to go in and say, A, B, talk. Just spending a couple of minutes lets the student know what's on the page, lets them start to think about what they want to say about it. Okay? I'd like to, to introduce, before we actually do uh, the task, introduce one quick thing that we don't usually think of as language planning, but that can be, and that's pronunciation. Um, a, a very important point, I think, about pronunciation. Where does pronunciation start? <laughs> People are looking at me like, trick question, right? <laughs> now, and I don't mean... Uh, uh, the reason I ask that is because if you ask your students, they'll say, right? Because they think pronunciation is a mechanical thing that starts in your mouth. I would suggest that pronunciation actually starts in your mind. And until you can get it, until you can deal with the pronunciation in your mind, you can deal with pronunciation mechanically, but it doesn't have legs. It doesn't... Um, it doesn't expand outside of the highly controlled, you know, sheep-ship kind of exercise. So I encourage my students to do silent pronunciation work. And this actually works very, very well for language planning for a reason I'll, I'll show you in a minute. What do I mean by silent uh, pronunciation work? Literally, I mean silent listen and repeat. Now. You all know how to do listen and repeat, but I'd like to ask you to do it just because I'm going somewhere with it, okay? Why do we do listen and repeat? Pronunciation practice, right? The first time you say something in a foreign language, it's physically difficult. We want students to get past that. Can I do a quick listen and repeat on these first couple lines? I'll say it and you repeat it, okay? My best friend as a child was my. My best friend as a child was my. Where did you meet? She lived next door. Okay, now can you do silent listen and repeat? I'll say it and you say it. You know, your mouth's moving, you're, you know, but you're not, but no sound. So for example, uh, my best friend as a child was my. Where did you meet? She lived next door. When did you notice pronunciation? Did you notice when you're doing this aloud, it's just blah, 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 get the noise out there. When you were silent, you can actually notice tongue, teeth, lips. You notice the mechanics of pronunciation. And most activities in your book have some kind of target language. It might be a language map or a grammar box or target sentences, something like that. By spending two or three minutes on that right before a fluency-oriented activity. You're focusing the students. You are, in many ways, preparing them for the kind of language they're going to need. That's language planning. That's language preparation. Okay? And now, can I ask... Oh, one other... <coughs> a note about music. I left that background music on. Why the background music? And I'll turn it off right now, because we're... <laughs> I very often use background music when the students are doing language planning activities for two reasons. Number one, background music is relaxing. And relaxed students learn like up to 25% more. That alone would make it worthwhile. But the real reason I use background music is to get me to shut up. Because like many other teachers, you know, if, if, if it's a language classroom and it's silent, I'm not doing my job. Right? I mean, it's, I get uncomfortable with silence. But by having a little background music there, it makes it okay. And, and that is one thing that it, that's usually not thought of with background music, but I think it's a very useful benefit. It, it fills up the sound, so it, gives, it makes it okay for everybody to take a little time. And now, can I ask you, speaking of taking a very little time, to take a minute or so Turn to the person next to you and actually answer the one or two questions. And again, you're doing this in the other language. If you did the smiley faces, choose any one that you gave a smile to. If you decided on one, that's the one you're doing. A minute or two to talk to your partner.
Go. together all right what what you just did before that activity uh, were four very very simple types of language planning just read the questions sometimes you think consciously about the answers sometimes just reading the questions is enough because it makes the students familiar with what they're going to be doing okay um, so looking at the questions, deciding which ones you're actually going to do, rating the questions. And I find if students start out with the ones that are most interesting, that kind of creates the atmosphere you're after. Now you could argue that, yeah, but they're moving toward the boring ones. True, but they may never get there. And very often it's not, there are very few questions that are in and of themselves interesting or boring. It's where the students go with it. And if they're starting out, involved and engaged in the activity. That's likely to keep going. What I would like to do is, is um, <clears throat> go back to our list of benefits of language planning and say just a little bit more um, about language planning. Uh, increased fluency. This, I guess, is no surprise because when you think of in whatever form, whether it's... Yeah, you have a question? So, choosing a question based on what Korean vocabulary I had to answer, which is great in terms of practicing my fluency, but it's not great in terms of me practicing the vocabulary. Right. How do you handle that? Can, can I put that on hold until point four of here because, it, because vocabulary is a really important issue. But the, the, if you didn't hear it, the question was uh, choosing things according to what you were able to say so the fluency work, okay? And that, and fluency is definitely part of it. And all of the research in language planning show, show increases in fluency, which makes sense because you've mentally been through it once. So naturally it's going to come more, sm more smoothly, right? Um, and very related is complexity. Penny Ear points out that, that one reason in uh, spoken, okay, okay, spoken English is very, very different than written English. And one of the reasons it's so different is because spoken English is full of false starts. And, and, and we, we start something and then we rearrange it. And because we are inventing as we speak what we want to say. Okay? Now, increased complexity comes from the fact that when you give students a minute or two to think things through, they figure out, to some degree, what it is they want to say, and they're able to put it together more precisely. Yeah? So accuracy in terms of meaning. Not, not necessarily grammatical accuracy, but the complexity because they are saying more precisely what they want to say. Now, where it gets messy is increased accuracy. Because what happens is basically this. Language planning activities can either be teacher-directed or sort of organic where the students are 
mentally developing what they want to say. And of the things that we did, when I asked you just look at the questions, think of your answer, you were generating all of that. I wasn't, I wasn't directing it, right? Um, the pronunciation thing was teacher-led. Uh, and often what happens, teacher-led language planning activities will lead to increased accuracy. Student-generated language planning activities often do not lead to increased accuracy, but for a good reason. What happens when you increase fluency and you increase complexity? You're raising the overall level of language, so you are coming up with new creative errors, right? So it actually is progress. The, the accuracy may drop, but that's because the general language level is going up. Okay, so it's not something to worry about. I think what we need to do then is just look at it and balance it. And sometimes we're doing student-generated things, and sometimes we're doing teacher-directed uh, things. Okay, now vocabulary. The activity that we were doing, being fluency-oriented, <coughs> wasn't designed to, you know, input vocabulary. But vocabulary is very, very important. And what we need to remember is vocabulary is not black and white. It's not like the words I know, the words I don't know. It's more like the words I know, the words I am learning, and the words I don't know. And those words in the, I'm just learning these. It's estimated you need to meet new vocabulary somewhere between 7 and 20 times in order to become in order to make it yours, in order to really be able to use it, okay? Now, what happens with instant production activities is you have no time to reach into that box of words you're just learning. You, you have to rely on the, the vocabulary that's instant, okay? Now, <clears throat> to answer your question, well, you know, I'm picking the things that I know how to say. Yeah, and if you have time to think it through, then you're able to say, okay, now, now, how do I say that in Korean? Or for our students, how do I say that in English? So they're able to get at some of that new vocabulary. Okay? Now, I'm not addressing the issue of, of vocabulary input, which absolutely they need. You know, my, my solution for that is extensive reading. Lots and lots of, of reading for vocabulary input. But they need, in terms of production, they need ways to be able to access the words in the middle. And finally, uh, in terms of, of the why, fossilization. Well, one of the big reasons for fossilization is fossilization is you're using whatever you're locked into. And to deal with fossilization, you've got to notice language, language awareness, which language planning can be, you know, focus on form, things like that can be part of it. But you also need to think through, how am I going to say it? How am I going to move beyond the instant, if incorrect, way that I can say it? And there is some, some evidence that, that language can, planning can help with fossilization. It's not, it's not a silver bullet. I mean, nothing is, okay? I should mention, by the way, when I mention, I should mention, uh, you know, credit where credit is due. Uh, last year, Martin Bygate was at uh, this conference, and uh, he has done a lot of very important and fascinating uh, research with language planning. Peter Skian, um, Pauline Forster, Rod Ellis, Tony Lynch, there are a whole bunch of people who are you know, doing really, really interesting work. I've listed a number of them on the bibliography, and we may have run out of, there are a few copies of the bibliography here. If any of you didn't get it, Grab one afterwards, or on the green handout, the, the, I've, I have put the bibliography on my home page. Um, on the back page, it lists that URL. But I guess what I'm trying to do is, is take some of this research and say, that's great. Now, what does it mean Monday morning in a class of 50 students who may be at an elementary level and who may be at various levels of motivation. And, and how do we take this research and say, great, what, do, what does it mean in the classroom? And one of the things I'm particularly interested in is there are very few books that include anything like language planning. The good part is it doesn't matter because it's fairly easy to add on. And that's the purpose of that greenish-blue handout. There are about a dozen 
techniques that you can add on to nearly any textbook activity. Okay? Now, what we did in the first activity set was four different activities based on one textbook task. Normally I wouldn't do that. Normally I do one, perhaps two things. I was trying to get a bunch of stuff in a very short time. I'd like to do one other uh, set of activities. This is on the uh, back of that white sheet. And uh, it's called Where Did You Go? And can I ask you to just take a moment and think about a trip you took. Could have been a vacation or if you did a school trip at some point or uh, it could have been a wonderful vacation, or if you ever had, you know, the vacation from hell, you know, a bad one. It doesn't really matter. But can I ask you to just take a moment, write where you went in the middle, and then make a few notes. Who did you go with? What did you do? What else? When? Two or three minutes, make a few notes to talk to your partner. Okay, now what some of you may have recognized that you're actually working on there is a mind map. Yeah? But I designed it to look like that so that you don't have to know what a mind map is. You could just think, oh, it looks kind of like a sun, which is fine. Do you use mind mapping? Some of you, you know what, I, this, this is an example of a mind map. This is actually a mind map about doing mind maps. And, and I, maybe I should share this. I, for years, I resisted. Use, I've known about them, but I didn't use them because I was, I was taught mind mapping as a way of note taking. And, and it's fine for that. But until I started realizing that, wow, as a way of note making, it is a very, very powerful tool. And once I got that, wow, makes a lot of sense. Now, I don't really have time to go deeply into mind maps, but what I would encourage you to do is, in your handout, on the green one, you have the same information presented two ways. One is a list, a traditional linear set of information, and the other is a mind map that contains information about mind mapping. I would encourage you to uh, have a look at that and see if this might be something your students could use as a way of mental preparation. Okay? And another form of mental preparation that I like a lot, and I always have to be careful about this, <laughs> is guided visualization. Some people call it a guided journey, which I kind of, like, now I, I need to acknowledge from the beginning, this is not everybody's cup of tea. In fact, it's a little bit weird. Because what, what it basically, okay, basically a guided visualization is just inviting the students to close their eyes and asking them some questions 
that helps them think through what they're going to talk about. Now, is it a little weird? Sure. Think about the classroom. You know, we actually do quite a few things in the classroom that um, if you did at a party, you'd probably get kicked out, right? I mean, it, like, think of it, you know, th- how many of you use uh, dialogues in your classroom, right? Most of us do not. Think, think of that situation. Let's have a conversation. Here's your part, here's my part. That's a little weird. <laughs> or next time, you, next time you go to a restaurant or you go to a bar, turn to the person at the next table and say, listen and repeat, right? <laughs> We do stuff in the classroom that is weird. Now, once you get that, a guided visualization is simply inviting people to close their eyes to get rid of all the extra visual stuff. Because we take in so much information visually that that can get in the way of imagination. Because there's just so much to process. Um, Okay, so you, you invite them to close their eyes and ask them a few questions, and it just makes it that much easier. And so, I think we have time for this. Can I invite you to close your eyes? And some students will initially like, why? And their eyes will get really big. (laughs) Don't push it. Once the students are comfortable with it, once they're relaxed, most of them will be happy to close their eyes. And in your mind, you can imagine that wonderful vacation you took. And in your mind, you can experience that vacation now. And you see yourself, and you look around, and you notice where you are. Are you indoors or outdoors? Notice the place What colors do you see? What textures? Are there buildings? Nature? What do you notice? What can you see? And then listen. What do you hear? Are there people? Who are they? What are they saying? And what else do you hear? And what do you feel? Notice the temperature. Is it hot, cold? Is there a breeze? Are you standing or sitting and you can feel your body against a chair or against the ground? And what do you feel in your heart? What's your emotion? And now take a deep breath and notice any smells, any tastes. And you'll have 30 seconds of clock time, which is all the time you need to experience that vacation. And as you do, see, hear, and feel now that trip. And when you're ready, come back to the room, take a deep breath, and open your eyes. There's a woman in the front with a great smile. I can tell you didn't want to come back, right? <laughs> okay. Did you notice that that was actually a very real experience? And if you were having the students do that, they're much more able to talk about it because you've just gotten them in touch with it. Now, as I said, it's not everybody's cup of tea. If you don't like it, great, no problem. There are lots and lots of other actors.
organizing the senses. We all have the five senses and we all use all of them. Everybody is visual plus something else as, as the primary sense, I mean the, the main one we use. So I started out with your visual imagery, what you were seeing. And then I moved into what you were hearing. And then I moved into the uh, kinesthetic, the sense of touch, which includes both physical touch, tactile, and movement and also emotion. So I ran it through the senses to make it so that you were experiencing it in whatever your strongest sense was, just to make it more real. A couple of things I often do in the classroom then, which I won't do here, is then do a straight uh, mental rehearsal. Okay? And what I would do is invite the students, for example, if, if they saw that in pictures, I encourage them to rewind the videotape and watch it again. And as they watch it, think about what they're going to say. Narrate it to themselves. Or, and this is for more auditory learners, just think about the story and listen to that story. Or, and this is for the kinesthetic, the, the students who learn through movement, through feeling, talk to yourself. And I don't mean like the people on the subway who are doing that, you know. I mean, just mentally, either sub-vocalize, you know, speak with no sound, or actually just mumble through the story, telling it to themselves, okay, as a way of getting ready. And then after they had done it, I would very often have them change partners and tell the story again. Task recycling. As teachers, we're often afraid to do an activity more than once because we think the students are going to get bored. As long as it's real information and they have new partners, most students appreciate the chance to do something again because they've done it once. Now it's easier. Now I can do it better. Task recycling can be a very powerful tool. I need to finish in about two minutes. Um, as I said, there are very few language planning activities in textbooks. The fortunate thing is it really doesn't matter. There are lots of ways to add language planning to whatever it is you're teaching tomorrow. A few things, and all of these are in the green handout. You don't need to take notes. Personalized listening questions. Most of your textbooks have some kind of listening, and it's always a and B are talking, you're listening in to somebody else's conversation, which my mama always said is not polite. <laughs> ask, ask questions directly to the students. If, if they're doing a, uh, what, description of people, you know, you're like, okay, so uh, how long is your hair? Write a sentence. Uh, what do you like? Write, or, I'm sorry, what do you look like? Write three words. Okay? And an interesting thing, we talked about accuracy versus fluency things. Ask them four or five questions. They write down their answers. And that is the language planning for a discussion activity. You can do it as fluency work, compare answers, or accuracy work. Look at your answers. Can you remember the questions? Okay? So you can play with it there. Another thing I often do, three-minute conversation task. If they've been doing something with, with, a, um, with the textbook dialogue, so close the book. Work with your partner, you got three minutes, talk about, I specify the task, and in that case, the dialogue work has become the planning for their own conversation. Work with the language map. We talked about pronunciation things, there are ideas in your handout. Preview the page, just give the students a couple minutes to look over it. Um, evaluate the questions, the smiley faces, or, or just, you know, read the questions, circle the ones that look interesting. English, please, is simply, if this is something challenging that I don't think they're going to be able to handle, I'll have, okay, go ahead, do it in Korean first. You got two minutes. Now, brr, back up, have the same conversation in English that you just had in Korean. They've done the mental work in Korean. They're able to get at the English much more, much more effectively. Guided visualization. Again, there are suggestions in the handout how to make that work. Mental rehearsal. Just giving them a minute or two to, to go through it. Drawing pictures. Sort of like mind maps, it's a great way to get ready and task recycling. Okay? And I think if we can give students a minute, let them think, what do I want to say? How am I going to say it? We are preparing them. Now, in a language classroom, you're never sure exactly what's going to come up. A lot of it is chance. 
But as Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. Thank you all very much.